the Endo meeting on February 14th, a day that will live on in infamy. Um, we have two topics on the agenda today. We've already run a topic off the record uh, to the conclusion, but I'm asking ZB to uh, recap that for the record. And uh, Aaron has questions uh, for me, presumably, and for, for those of us in with uh, uh, pet demon um, answers. So, ZB. Yeah, so apologies for a bad recap. Let me get started. Um, we have a... Uh, uh... We have a topic around the issue in Endo Repository 2033. Uh, that issue uh, points out a uh, bug that happens uh, where Lockdown is interacting with a uh, with an application uh, that is built with Next.js, the framework. Um, the error message says exports is not defined. Uh, which prompted my involvement because it looks like common JS. Uh, what we managed to establish is uh, that this is um, not using endo, uh, endo's compartment mapper. Uh, so it's not touching our common JS implementation. Uh, and the error, along with some of the call stack information, seems to be pointing at a situation with. Uh, Webpack or the, the, the bundling process itself. Uh, and we would need to look into it from that angle. Uh, meanwhile, uh, Thomas mentioned that he got uh, Next.js working with hardened JavaScript before um, and has some experience. Uh, we requested that he drops uh, some notes on that experience uh, in the issue thread. Uh, and we also got uh, some of the context for what the application intends to be, uh, which, um, which gave us uh, a, a bit more of... Uh, of the ability to like assess that this is mostly focused on using uh, lockdown. Uh, and then I gave a short rant <laughs> on why I'm skeptical about uh, ever uh, integrating the wider uh, set of uh, our security technology with Next.js in its current form, uh, because uh, like to list it very quickly, Next.js uh, has been seen modifying globals uh, in the browser. Uh, Next.js is working on its own bundler capable of wrangling multiple dependency trees in one bundling process to support React server components. And our friend Zach, uh, who is uh, building uh, Webpack module federation and expanding that to other bundlers uh, had the most struggles uh, with keeping uh, module federation compatible with Next.js. So this means uh, integrating with Next.js is going to be a lot of effort and it's a moving target. Uh, that's why I'm skeptical. Again, not saying this is impossible. Uh, just saying that this um, is going to be more work uh, than we might be able to handle if we want to integrate Lava Mode into it specifically. I think uh, sooner or later we can get anything to work under lockdown. It's a matter of uh, persistence in finding what breaks and fixing. Did I miss anything? I think that was the whole talk. Thank you. That was a very condensed 30 minutes. <laughs> um, let me turn over to Aaron. We've got questions on the demon. Um, uh, for for uh, everyone else, uh, Eric and Aaron have been working full time on uh, helping us, <laughs> helping me, helping, helping us get a uh, 
reach the point where we can connect demons over the network uh, as, a, in the, as, as, as soon as possible. Yeah, so while uh, doing some of that work, I just started assembling a laundry list of questions. So in no particular order, I would like to ask about um, a utility function that we use uh, frequently, or we use in a few different places called formula identifier for ref. Um, this is maybe actually a weak map or it's backed by a weak map if it's a function. Um, and we use it to say, hey, what is the ID for this value? And that value is generally a remote presence. And that from CAPTP, we uh, know that that remote presence, if we get it, you know, if we get a remote presence for the same object twice, they're going to turn into the same object because of the weak map that's inside of CAPTP. Um, however, we may get the same remote presence for different formulas. Um, for example, if you create an eval formula that takes uh, remote presence A as an endowment and just returns A, then it will have the value A. And now formula ID for that eval formula and the formula for that endowment, whatever it came from, those will both map from that value to those formula IDs. And this will confuse formula identifier for ref because it is expecting a one-to-one -one relationship. Do we want to change this to be a one-to-many and like have a set on the other side? Um, is this, is the violation of this one-to-one -one expectation significantly problematic? Uh, I don't expect it to break anything given that any formula that ultimately produces the same value is going to be equivalent but i wouldn't object to making it more correct um we um curious what we would do with what we would do with multiple values it, it's almost it's almost certain it might be absolutely certain that the first identifier that's added to that map is going to refer to the, the, the primal formula identifier for that thing. So it might be acceptable to instead keep it as a single, single value and just not overwrite if, uh, if, if already present. Already is present. So we do use this uh, for reverse lookup in mail. Um, reverse lookup in mail takes a value and returns a pet name. Um, um, potentially multiple pet names, correct? Yes. Thank you. Um, pet names could in turn refer to all of the various formulas that ultimately point to that thing. Yeah, I think that that's a convincing argument for turning it into a set. Okay. And to ensure that reverse lookup produces all of the pet names that might ultimately refer to the same value. Uh, then, then my follow-up question to that is: so, if we turn it into a one-to-many relationship, when we don't know which specific formula we should uh, return, uh, should we just return the first one under the assumption that it is the primal one? Yeah, yeah. We should we should do a left traversal into that now deeply nested structure um the i tried to identify all the usage sites one was in host provide powers formula identifier but i think that was an unnecessary usage and maybe was already factored out from my make guest make host uh, pr the other place was in mail reverse lookup that's we obviously need that to work as expected um, and then was there other places in the daemon where we were reading and not just setting? I think reverse lookup is the only use case for that data structure. Um, do we not use it for well, the we use terminator or something? Oh, I see. Uh, we shouldn't. 
we should not use the river uh, we should not use that, dis that that structure for termination. I, we might be, but we shouldn't. Um, the yeah, when we cancel the the value for a particular pet name and its transitive dependence, that should be synchronous, and it should reach through the formula DAG, well, the 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 code DAG, the the reverse the reverse DAG. Um, But it shouldn't exit that. It shouldn't fall through to reverse lookup because it can't reliably <clears throat> do that in one turn of the event loop. It can't transactionally cancel something that isn't discoverable through the through the formula DAG. Got it. Okay. Yeah, it does. Okay. Thanks. That was clarifying. Um, the that is a little bit problematic for eval formulas that are being used as an intermediate step to getting a value that does have a formula, but can't be discovered, um, that can't be discovered by, uh, uh, by, by, if you ultimately have to do a reverse lookup on awaiting the promise for the eval, then you're outside of the single turn. It might be that the way that we solve that problem is by shortening, um, shortening formula chains which is analogous to promise chain shortening. It's to say that if eval, in, in the long term, it would be really cool if the value that eval formulas settle to can be marshaled data, not marshaled cap data, and then replace the original formula. Um, and in that case, then we would be able to do a transitive block of all of the slots of the marshaled formula um, and, and, and synchronously dispose, uh, synchronously terminate the things that are reached through eval. We have not done that. I suggest that we just live with the deficiency until, until we get around to doing something like that. Um, uh, for so for sorry, Mark's I... benefit, Mark, are you, are you eavesdropping at this point or, 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 uh, or paged out? Uh, I, I'm sorry. I was um, I was half listening and half paying attention to something else. So so I'm sorry. No, it's no worries. It's it's deep in the weeds, and we have and you don't have a lot of context. I just want to make sure that um, make sure that we keep you up to speed, so that when this comes to something, it comes to your attention that it's that that well, we can we can have a conversation about questionable design decisions. Um, the the invariant that we are trying to preserve is that um, you will not run into doppelgangers for a sturdy ref. Um, because of this formula separation from the CAPTP layer, the CAPTP layer has ephemeral, has an ephemeral potentially cyclic reference graph that could potentially retain previous incarnations of the same sturdy ref. Um, Sorry, when you when you say sturdy ref, what do you mean? Yeah, that's a really great question. I have no idea what sturdy ref means in this context. Okay. <laughs> what it, I, it, but... I, I I can I can be very clear about what I meant from sturdy ref as the coiner. Um, uh, I don't. I suspect it it doesn't correspond to any of the things you might mean. This does course. So we previously, so at the OCAP and call yesterday, we were talking about, uh, and and uh, we were talking about the QR code that would have a URL that is able to reestablish right. a, that's, a, that's, a connection to a, a, a live value. That's right. not I, a sturdy ref. You said that that is correct. That is not a sturdy ref. Okay. That's an offline capability. Okay, so these are offline capabilities. Um, we're, we're talking about offline capabilities then. <laughs> okay. So a formula, I mean, this is, this is, you know, where I'm, you know, my, my perpetual, um, uh, difficulty of trying to, to bridge, um, concepts is a formula is not an offline capability because it is not to a particular object, 
it's as the name suggests it's more like code to be evaluated to get whatever the code evaluates to at the moment and that's certainly you know not a capability to an object yeah, it's a it's a reference to an incarnation of a capability, and we are striving to preserve the illusion that each incarnation is only able to see the incarnations of its peers. Um, but so, but it, we can't do so perfectly. I think. Okay, so what do you, what do you mean by incarnation in this context? Yeah, so if you restart the pet demon, mm -hmm. and and then some, and because you re restarted, you lose a whole bunch of connections to your peers, right? Um, those peers are at liberty to right? they 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 themselves may have references via remote formulas, um, and the next time they need an incarnation of the value that so recently deceased in your incarnate uh, in, in your incarnation of the demon they will attempt to reconnect and the demon will attempt to rehydrate a formula for the pro the for for the value and it's a new incarnation it doesn't have the same identity but it does have the same okay. non it, it does have the same i'm sorry it have, does have the same what uh the swiss num the nonce um is, Only if that's part of the formula, right? Uh, the Swiss num and formula are uh, uh, the the demon contains a map from Swiss num to formula. Oh, okay. Uh, so, uh, and that map is I, I did I did hear the beginning conversation about one to one versus one to many. Um, uh, is that map? One to one or one to many. The 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 forward map is one to one, from the, Swiss num to formula. Yes, and that's what's persisted. We persist okay. a map. Uh, uh, we persist a map from Swiss num to formula, and formulas refer to each other with Swiss nums. Okay. So the DAG is assembled from. The, the the is is assembled from formulas and the edges are Swiss nums. So the Swiss num is the Swiss num a ever. I mean, is the original Swiss nums are communicated to a counterparty in order as in order to um, uh, claim to be authorized to invoke an object. Yes. Are, are these Swiss nums of that nature? Yeah, we have we uh, doing peer to peer connectivity has necessitated that we move in that direction, and has also necessitated that we ensure that the Swiss nums are indeed unique for every um, for every demon. Okay, so okay, so earlier in the conversation, I heard that multiple formulas might evaluate to the same object, but uh, and therefore, if the object to formula mapping would, could be one to many, but you're saying the Swiss num to formula uh, mapping is always one to one, and therefore the object to Swiss num correspondence must also be one to many. Am I confused? Mm. I might need you to say that again. Okay. So earlier in the conversation, I heard that multiple formula might evaluate to the same object yes and concretely that that occurs for example with evaluation formulas where you take an endowment and return it okay now that means that the object to formula mapping is one to many whether we whether we remember that in a data structure or not just logically it means that the relationship is one to many right um uh the swiss num to formula mapping is one to one. Therefore, the object to Swiss num mapping must be one to many. That's correct. And and that that's before we invite the complication of partial restarts. 
So if the object to Swiss num mapping is one to many, then the assumption is that the hosting site of the object will take, will accept any of those Swiss nums as proof of authorization to access that object? That's correct. Okay. Okay. Um, that's interesting. Uh, I don't see a contradiction there. Uh, it's certainly novel. I've never done a system with multiple Swiss nums designating the same object. Yeah, but we have done systems where there are promise chains, and this is yes, this is analogous at least. Okay, that's a good point. That's a good point because a pro because a promise can be designated by a Swiss num, and especially in E, where the promise becomes the um, the thing designated once it's fulfilled. Uh, you could therefore even in E in an emergent manner have multiple Swiss nums designating the same target object. I just, that didn't occur to me, but it actually was the case exactly because of promise resolution in it. Okay, interesting. Yeah, so the the wiggle that we're struggling with, now that we've, now that we've established that, it, that object to Swiss num is one to many, and that's definitive, and we should reflect that with the data structure for purposes of reverse lookup, which is to say there's, uh, a reverse lookup in the pet daemon starts with an starts with an object and returns an array of all of the local pet names that ultimately refer to that object. And that's just another level of indirection. We have to visit all of the we have to visit all of the Swiss nums and then reverse look up all of the Swiss nums to find out if we have corresponding pet names. Okay, and the and each pet name or pet name path is a formula. The formulas can be pet name paths, but not pet all name, formulas are pet name paths. Pet names refer to to Swiss nums internally. Pet names refer to Swiss nums. Okay, they retain um, the Swiss num retains the value. Okay, okay. So so formulas are not pet names. Formulas are a distinct. Right. Just, okay. Pet names okay. are absent in the formula DAG, though there are formulas for pet stores, and pet stores are maps from okay. name to formula number. So the okay. retention can the retention graph does exit to pet names and go back into formula identifiers at or pardon for to Swiss nums at okay. the pet store node. So for concreteness, can you just give some prominent examples of the formula? Yeah, the formula types are actually really, there are really quite few at the moment. Um, and, and we'd like to keep it that way. The, the obvious one is eval. Eval is a formula which indicates which worker to evaluate a block of source code in a one-time use compartment with a map of endowments. And the endowments are JavaScript names and their corresponding Swiss nums. Uh... Um, that's by far the most complicated. So the, okay. So the, are you assuming that you, okay, you and I are, 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 uh, mutually suspicious counterparties. Um, uh, we each have a VAT on our own machine. Um, if are you assuming that I can formulate a piece of code and send it to you for you to evaluate in your VAT? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, what if that code is an infinite loop? Then, then the then the worker it seizes up and dies, and then it becomes a user problem that they have to kill that process and um, and and force anybody who wishes to reconnect to the to the to the values referred to in that worker to um re recreate their references okay the so so you're saying that if i if i put up a 
shared service that any client of the service can trivially bring it down by asking it to evaluate an infinite loop. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and by default, every eval formula receives its own worker. They can be, you can, if you have, if you have the okay. nonce of a worker, you can designate one, but each, each agent that you connect to gets one worker and they can foul their own. Okay. That's, that's, um, so, okay. So, so just very concretely, just if, uh, if, you, if you're creating, you want to stand up a shared service. Um, uh, so you have a central vat on which the, the shared service is running. You want to, you know, uh, you want me to be one, to be able to be one of your clients of the service but without me being able to trivially bring it down by sending by sending an infinite loop mm -hmm. so what so how, how what is what is the what is it what does this arrangement look like such that when i send you a string to evaluate it evaluates in a separate worker uh the currently we haven't extended the evaluate method to um to third parties. We currently only have an evaluate function on the the owner's um the owner's API. The uh, each what we're calling hosts. Uh so guests do not currently have an evaluate function and don't get that capability. But oh, okay. But we think that it is coherent to add it with the constraint that each guest that you invite to connect to you will get one worker for free. Okay. Oh, and that worker is the only worker that they will have a Swiss num to access. Uh, or, or it'll be the only worker that they can name on your machine and they have okay. it and, and they own it exclusively. And all of the things that they evaluate naturally have to run in that until they request additional workers. And, okay. those, and those workers have to be given by the host. Okay, um, so, so, so that's good. Uh, it, it, um, it, it, this indicates that I, I misunderstood something early on. So let me go back, get, go back there and make sure I have a clearer picture. Um, uh, the, one of the kinds of formula is an eval, but the eval is not is at least in the current um, uh, system is not used for me to obtain an object from elsewhere. Question mark obtain an object from elsewhere obtain a reference to it obtain a remote reference i mean but okay so the the swiss nums and pet names are things i associate primarily with with how, remote things yeah I remote see. Things. okay how so I, how how i designate something that is remote from me and typically hosted by some service that is mutually suspicious with me. Right. Okay. So the answer for that is that remote is a different type of formula, um, which contains the Swiss num of that the Swiss num of the of the referent and the connection hints for obtaining a connection to to go to to connect to and locate that uh, to locate that value. And okay. it's the re and it's the rehydration only of remotes that give you remote references. Okay, so it sounds like the remote reference is actually very much it might very well be a sturdy ref. It's particular to a remote object as identified by a Swiss num and a, a host ID or VAT ID or whatever you call it. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and it just designates that one object. It's not, um, you know, under normal expectations, it's not intended to be something that can that 
depends on runtime conditions, what object it, it gets the reference to. Mm -hmm. Okay. So yeah, so that sounds very and very much like a sturdy ref. It contains the same information as an offline capability, genuine capability, um, uh, uh, but it's also encapsulated, presumably. Uh, yeah, I, I think oh. that I think it is in the sense that you mean. Um, yeah, it does not. It's, it's there. It's represented locally by an object that does not reveal the Swiss num to other objects that hold that object. That's correct. Okay. So that is a sturdy ref. Okay. Yeah. All right. Cool. I think that we have a lot, we've gained a lot of context with Mark. I want to go back to Aaron's questions. Um, and, and at some point we'll come back and dig into the, into the gnarly issue of multiple incarnations of the same sturdy ref possibly coexisting. Um, and, hopefully come to a, a, a good conclusion on that, but we don't have to today. But we do have to get through Aaron's questions. <laughs> um, yes, that, that was really interesting, the, especially the comparison of sturdy ref versus offline capability and incarnation of a capability. Uh, the, I'm, I'm not sure that I, I didn't get in my notes a clear definition of a sturdy ref besides those comparisons. So a sturdy ref uh, is a uh, it's a local object that um, designates some remote object, but it designates it uh, in a in a way that survives all of the normal um, uh, you know well classically all of the normal partition and crash and upgrade. Etc. Trauma, um, and then a live reference in classically um, uh, would be something that um, uh, would get severed on some kind of trauma, and like like a um, a, a crash and restart of the remote site, um, uh, and the sturdy ref is what you go back to to reestablish connectivity. So the sturdy ref continues to designate the remote object, but it doesn't, it, it does it, um, uh, now speaking at the implementation level, it does it by holding internally the same information as an offline capability, um, uh, but encapsulating the information uh, so that a, another object that holds the sturdy ref object does not see the cryptographic information. The cryptographic information is used to reestablish connectivity, but it's not revealed uh, at the object level. Okay, this is this that is a clarifying definition. The 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 key is that a sturdy ref is an object. Um, yes. And, uh, that means that in our current architecture a sturdy ref would be implemented as a handled promise that maintains its identity over the over potentially multiple incarnations of the corresponding remote object. Is mm -hmm. that correct? Yes. Yeah. Okay. We have not done that. <laughs> we have not done that. We definitely could. We so so we can clear that out. The pet demon currently has nothing called a sturdy ref. Okay. Okay. Um, it does have, it does have the cryptographic information for referring to a remote value. And currently every time you do, every time, um, a pet, yeah, we currently we reincarnate those things every time we need to, if you need to have access to a particular remote object, we reincarnate it and get some new identity. Uh, in E... It, that we did not try to make them look like promises. We, it was a distinct object type that had a method, I think called get live reference or something, or just get ref, mm -hmm. uh, that returned the live ref the, um, to, the, uh, to the same object that the sturdy ref designated. I see, uh, very much like a weak ref. Returned, I'm sorry, sorry. It, returned like. a prom it returned a promise for, for the remote object. Mm -hmm. Because oh. it's it started the the process of dereferencing, um, and it turned promise for what it would dereference to. 
you know, much like an, an sort of like an async weak ref in, in the um, API, the API being like, here's an object that indirectly refers to a thing and here's a method for getting the live reference from it. So Chris here, you would, you believe the current implementation of endo deviates from star deref because we don't recreate a live reference on a network disconnect? I, uh, yeah, essentially. We, well, we do not have any object in the pet daemon that maintains its identity, but ultimately refers to multiple possible incarnations of the same value. Right. Okay. We that makes sense. We, we could. There's, there's no reason we couldn't. Um, so we're at the hour. Uh, we can stop here. My, the next question on my list is about the RGC model. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, again, for Mark's benefit, we have not implemented garbage collection, but the pet demon gives us an interesting opportunity to use garbage collection as a tool that the user can hold to revoke access to um, revoke access to values. The um, and we'll we'll get into that some more. I I am I can stick around uh, and and let this meeting run over. I don't know if anybody wishes to uh, to log off and get to their next meeting, but I think I'll just hold the door open until the question queue is flushed. Okay, uh, great. Yeah, this is just a general question about like what what is our memory GC model? Not referencing the disk GC model, um, and. Uh, you know, I see some code that's like setting up reference tracking, but then also you can like actively kill a worker. Um, so yeah, if you could speak in the GC model, that would be great. Yeah. So uh, there are a, a bunch of layers, right? The let's let's start with at the root. So for what so there's a there's a directive acyclic graph, a tree that can converge. Um, that starts with the the primary user profile, right? The primary user profile contains a pet store, and these are and and that pet store is, uh, is a is the base of the is the is the root of the retention graph. For everything in the pet demon, um, so uh, the the user elects to retain incarnations of values by managing their pet store, by managing their pet names. That is to say, that if they delete a pet name, that is their wish to see that the the corresponding values demise, right, um, and because it's directed in acyclic, we can do ref counting. And when the ref countdown gets down to zero, we can synchronously maintain uh, the in-memory table, the, the in-memory graph from, uh, uh, from, a stir from a Swiss num to the corresponding formula and the formula to the corresponding value. Um, the and the idea being that if you wish no one to be able to, if the user wishes to, to no one to be able to access the thing, they can delete all of the references, all of the, delete all of the pet names that refer to that thing, and then be guaranteed synchronous, reliable, synchronous, local deletion of the corresponding entity. Um, and that's the base. That's the basis. And then the pet names, the pet names can then indirectly refer to other things that retain other things, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The, uh, there is potentially some interplay where live references retain formulas until the live references are c collected. And we use a fine, we would use a finalization registry for that. We're not using it yet. Um, and that I think is analogous to how the kernel retains an inode after 
that, that like a, a live current a, a live operating system kernel can retain an inode on the file system even when no other files refer to it right we can we could use the finalization registry in a similar fashion that a live reference to a thing can postpone um postpone the collection of of a formula now, again we don't delete formulas yet it's and we don't kill workers when they're no longer needed and nothing refers to them yet but our, my, my my hope is that we eventually will okay so going back to the taxonomies of formulas so we've got a eval formula which at least currently is only used against oneself uh on revival and then we have a a sturdy ref effectively um, for dereferencing remote things. Um, uh, what other formulas do we have? There's a formula for identifying a worker, which is just a nonce that corresponds to a worker. And any formulas, like eval formulas, that refer to that worker will be co-tenant if they converge on the same one. Um, we use the Swiss num also to address its logs, and the logs are... The logs for a worker um, persist across incarnations, persist against restarts, so for debugging purposes, but are otherwise not visible. Uh, what, do, what, do you, what do you mean by nonce? The Swiss num. The, the worker gets a Swiss num. Okay. Um, the are, are you the The Swiss num by itself is not adequate to demonstrate authority to invoke. That's correct. Yeah. Yeah, we, uh, there must be, uh, we, we keep, we persist. Well, we are on the way to, I don't know how close we are to this, but the intended, the, the intended state, the goal state for the code is that every nonce has a corresponding JSON file. Um, and in the case of a worker, it's a JSON file that just says that it's a type of worker, uh, that, that its type is worker. And the presence of that file indicates that a nonce locator, um, may return a value for that Swiss num. So anyone who holds the Swiss num for the worker can cause that worker to start. Okay, I have I have a bunch of questions which I probably should not ask in real time. Um, yeah, uh, worker is one. Um, pet stores have a uh, have an, have a have a formula. Um, the formula, and and then they also have some persistent storage, which is just effectively persisting a map from pet name to Swiss num. And uh, and that's maintained in memory synchronously, so all access. All reads and writes to the pet store are synchronous in memory, um, but return a promise for flushing to disk <laughs> whenever it's modified. The, uh, you know, and then hosts and guests, all of the agents, all the, all the representations of agents have a Swiss num. We will soon be able to have a distinction between the, the, uh, use and refer to an agent. That is a huge flaw in the current implementation we're going to fix soon. Um, okay. The, uh, yeah, so you'll be able to have, this, there will be a Swiss num for a handle, which refers to an agent and would be used for like doing, uh, for revealing the user that has sent or received a message. Um, based off of the pet name that the current user refers to them by, um, but otherwise has no power um, at, at, as a separate thing from the the actual agent that has the APIs, the, the power bearing APIs for the host or guest. Um, there are some sundry other little ones that are implementation details, um, but uh, those those are the those are the big ones. Okay. Uh, and are are there any others that come off of the top of mind that might be Jermaine, Aaron, or Eric? Is we have we're going to have handles 
host and guest agents, workers, eval, lookup, where uh, Eric added a lookup formula, which is uh, for traversing the name hub API. Hmm. Um, basically makes it possible to have dotted, well, dot delimited pet name paths. Uh, the um, And then there's one that you get as a freebie for bootstrapping cap, uh, weblets, uh, which isn't important and can change over time. It's just turned out to be an implementation detail. Oh, and then of course the makers, um, the caplet makers. There's a uh, there's a formula for making a confined program from a bundle with endowments, and another one for making an unconfined program from a path on your file system. And that's that's the basis for plugins. Oh, and store. There's a content address store. In which case, the Swiss num is not a Swiss num. It's a uh, it's a content address of the same width. That one's. I think just, I'm, yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm going to to take off as well. All right. Okay. Thanks, Mark. Yep. Um, uh, so in the implementation of uh, the daemon, there's the, this dies, if that dies, uh, utilities, and are those set up the reference counting, or is that more about like the active killing of things? That's, uh, yeah, that's right. That's, so, uh, yeah, again, there are two retention graphs. One is for retention of formulas and one for retaining incarnations of the formulas, right? The, uh, the, the cancellation tree is, uh, the cancellation tree synchronously realizes, um, the inverse dependency tree for all of the values that have been incarnated and it's rooted and each of those uh, each of so every every node every controller every, for all of the entities that, that form, for every formula um knows which other formulas it depends upon such that if they were to disappear then their their incarnation should cease to exist as well so concretely the reason for all of that is that if we have a broken captp connection like if you have a so for the remote formula in particular if we have a remote formula um, that means that we have a local sturdy ref essentially not quite but yeah, except for the caveat that its identity is maintained across the internet. Uh, there's a reference to a remote object that is the incarnation of a remote formula. And if, and that depends upon a CAPTP connection being held open for the lifetime of that value. And if that CAPTP connection closes, it's what, what will happen automatically is that 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 promise that you hold will be rejected immediately. CAPTP on close will um, will disconnect that reference and all messages sent to it from that point on will be rejected. Um, so you basically have a tombstone for the remote object. What needs to happen for the purposes of the, of the pet demon is for us to forget that ever existed such that if anybody needs that value again in the future, that we create a future, uh, we create a new incarnation on demand, right? And and then anything that depends upon it should also automatically be canceled. So so what we're doing with the if this dies, that dies is building out this tree of hey, if this thing, if we lose this connection, what are all what objects has that infected? What what caplets are no longer going to be able to do their job? What um, uh, what uh, uh, yeah, anything that was derived from that reference needs to be destroyed 
such that if you need it again, it will be uh, that it that it will cause that connect that remote connection uh, cause the demon to attempt to reconnect to that remote, um, and then reconstruct the permission graph from there. Um, so that's what's going on there, and uh, I have not yet reasoned out what the relationship is between that and garbage collection of the underlying formulas, but there certainly is one, right? If it is no longer, um, if nothing retains a worker, for example, it should, it should be, it should be torn down. Currently it's not. Right. Currently, currently, there's there's no relationship between the gar gar garbage collection and cancellation. But what the relationship ought to be is that if no, if there's no path, if there is no path through the formula DAG to a worker anymore, we should also cancel it in the incarnation space. That makes sense. Yeah. Um... It, so oh likewise uh, likewise in a commit that has not landed deep down in our in in my stack there was one where i added the ability for a caplet to observe its own cancellation so that it can do it exactly right. what i was going to ask about yeah um what well, it's created with a cancellation promise or something yeah it'll receive a second argument which which is a, a remotable that allows them to observe their own cancellation. Okay. And then they could uh, write some state to persistence or something. Right. Okay. Before the worker is killed with, so there will be a graceful. So, so when a worker is killed, when a worker is canceled, that will set a timer. Um, Anything that lives in it should also, by the virtue of cancellation propagation, be aware that it has been canceled and have an opportunity to begin the work to, to to clean up after itself. Yeah. But after after the graceful timeout, the can't the 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 demon will force kill it. So okay. If the worker does not manage to exit on its own, it will be killed. Yeah. Uh, we we merged the renaming of terminate and kill to cancel. Uh, and in that, you renamed Terminator to Context. Uh, what motivated uh, the name Context? Context it's gonna... is, yeah, it's by analogy to an API I'm familiar with that I'm hoping that other developers will remember. Very unlikely. Um, <laughs> Go has a context object. It's very much like the async context that is being proposed for JavaScript. It's also very similar to thread local storage, but... Um, but not thread local storage. Let's not taint it with that. Uh, the, there's a, yeah, uh, in Go, the way, this is all based off of the exact same API in Go. There's a context. The context allows you to propagate cancellation and timeout as well as some other metadata. Um, we're not taking advantage of the metadata storage. Async context might do that for us in the future. It's, it, it's that. It's it's named context because this is analogous to the async context API. Mm. Um, yeah, and that and and I'm also so the um, it's it's analogous as well to an abort controller and the abort signal, mm -hmm. um, and the context object solves some of the same problems, but it's solving them in a way that's very very specific to the demon, and I do not know whether it generalizes. Um, cancellation should be synchronous. And if you're using a promise to model cancellation, it can't be. Um, it, it, like the, the, can't, the, the, the rejection of a promise is not synchronously observable, but if you create a context and the context has the rejection cancellation promise. You can synchronously observe cancellation on the context and also be able to asynchronously observe it on the promise. Being able to asynchronously observe cancellation on the promise is just a very good compositional API in addition to being able to observe synchronously. Um, and uh, like, for example, you can treat uh, that, that when a CAPTP, when CAPTP 
uh, reject uh, when CAPTP disconnects, it rejects all of the promises that cross its membrane, um, which is effectively cancellation. So you can you can propagate it really nicely. Um, speaking of cancellation, there was that um, I created an issue for the bug. Uh, we discussed in Matrix uh, about cancellation not propagating correctly under certain circumstances. Um, I guess uh, we're way over time. Maybe we could take just to review um, what the desired behavior should be so I can investigate it uh, okay. properly. Yeah, the, the desired behavior is that restart is like... the behavior difference between like suppose you issue the command endo restart mm -hmm. your expectation is that everything will be effectively canceled and sure. it's all gone mm -hmm. the expectation if you say endo cancel endo is the same is the same except that the process persists mm -hmm. Right. So, you, but so there shouldn't be, from the perspective of, like within the universe of Endo, uh, you, there shouldn't be an observable difference. That's correct. There should not be an observable difference. There, there will be edge cases when, because of just retention cycles in the ephemeral promise, in the ephemeral handled promise graph. But um, there's not much we can do about that. <laughs> um, those ephemeral references all exist within workers, which should be killed. So, yeah, again, it should not be observable. But because of the graceful timeout window, there will be a time while some of those old references ex coexist. And there is an oper a window of opportunity. Within the graceful win restart window, there is a po possibility that you would retain an object from a previous incarnation. It's not ideal. The but yeah, to be clear, the for this case that you've discovered, mm -hmm. canceling canceling the counter should propagate to the doubler, mm -hmm. and the doubler should restart at zero after mm -hmm. the counter has been canceled, and you are observing that it's not. This is tricky. <laughs> I thought I had fixed this once. <laughs> I was not confident, but there's um the trick is that there's a an intermediate pet store involved here. Mm. Um and the mailbox. The mailbox. So what's what's happening here is that the doubler is getting the counter either because of the request resolving or from the pet store with the name that it was stored to mm -hmm. um right because the doubler agent is, has a pet store the pet the doubler agent is going to have a my counter pet name that refers to the counter mm -hmm. um the relationship the relationship for cancellation propagation is usually, in most cases, is these are the things that I needed in order to construct myself. That's mm -hmm. trivial. But for for the for a caplet, it is able to accrue dependencies through the request function over time. Um, and the cancellation path has to be assembled at runtime from those from those from those runtime dependency discoveries there is probably a break there is probably a break in the cancellation path somewhere in there um mm -hmm. and my feeling about this is that we might not want to bother solving this problem until we have cleaned up until we have cleaned up message propagation and maybe even until we've gone so far as to persist messages across restarts. Mm. Persisting mailboxes across restarts is tricky because you have to preserve 
And to do so in good conscience, you have to preserve the numbering, which means it's not like a pet store. It's like a pet store in that you have like number to message references. Um, but unlike a pet store, because uh, you don't get to pick your pet names, they're incremental. Mm -hmm. Incremental numbers. It is not my intention to reveal that in a web-based user interface, but there we are. Right. Uh, and so you said, you say we may not want to bother solving this until, the, what was the first thing? Uh, until we have... Threading cancellation through messages. Yeah, threading cancellation through messages is... And persistence of messages. And, yeah, but also simplification of messages. We have a big opportunity to simplify messages um, because uh, we the the code as the code as written today reflects the architecture before we were revealing nonces to the wire. Mm -hmm. Now we can do that. the The message queue could have nonces in it. We don't have to do any of the pet name dubbing until it gets to the user interface, and then the user interface can use reverse lookup from mm -hmm. or or identify. I think, right? Uh, is it? Uh, I don't remember which method, but it takes. Yeah, it would take a nonce and give you the corresponding list of pet names. Um, and then um. So there's the case well, where here, obviously, it's mediated by the inbox. And I realized I had uh, omitted a crucial step in this, which is that you have to resolve the counter, mm -hmm. um, which, you know, here we see that the mailbox is involved. But uh, in this second case, that's probably distinct then because there's no mailbox involved. Mm -hmm. uh, like if I use the inspector to get a reference to the main worker and then kill the main worker, like that should, um, or, you know, it happens to be the main worker. It's the worker of the counter. That's the, that's the important thing here. And if I kill that, that should kill the worker, which should then reset the counter because yeah. Or is the, is there, is the main worker special in any way, like in terms of how it operates, like relative to other workers? Like this, this should cause. Um, yeah, killing the worker know, should need does need to propagate to anything that lives inside of the worker. Yep. Uh, so. So this eval it, formula once again is laundering, laundering mm -hmm. a relationship. Yeah, yeah, it's the uh, yeah, it's eval eval laundering uh, once again. Um, so, so maybe, it... yeah, or, or look up laundering or some combination yeah. to, yeah. um, oh, that might be actually, yeah, that might be the issue here. Uh, it might be that on terminate hook that we need to write for lookup formulas. Yes. Yes. Walk the, yeah, yeah, you're right. Because this is just, um, this is probably under the hood resolving to a lookup formula id and then you know kill or cancel as the case may be is just uh mm -hmm. to trying to cancel the lookup formula and it's like cool i canceled the lookup formula okay yeah so that's the set that's that case uh so we have that's tracked elsewhere okay <clears throat> all right yep i had two short ones remaining just for cool. completionist's sake. Um, in a issue, PR comment somewhere, you indicate an intention to move the weblet hosting to 127.0.0.1 port number nonce. Um, and we were unsure about why the nonce is in the path because the port already specifies the, uh, it refers to the nonce. Right. Um... The, the reason for that is, and, and this was a security flaw that we've patched years ago in Agoric's deploy system. Um, the, reason, the reason for the nonce being in the path and rejecting any HTTP request that lacks the nonce in the path uh, or a different nonce, God forbid, is that uh, yeah, it's analogous to the access token we use in Agoric SDK. The, the reason for its existence is that 
um, the host is not ne necessarily a single tenant system. We can rely, we can, so, so uh, <clears throat> Unix systems are by design multi-tenant. <laughs> like it's, we don't use them that way very often, <laughs> but <laughs> um, gosh, and it in back in the day, you would have a Sun server running off in the cloud, and you know all of the students and faculty at your university would be sharing a computer, um, and and logging into it via a terminal. And Unix is designed for that model, in which case any tenant on that system can connect to 127.0.0.1 on any port. Um, and it doesn't matter which user they are, they'll be able to create a session. This is actually the case on a modern laptop or, or Windows box, especially a Windows box where you have multiple open profiles. Um, that, yeah, hosting on 127.0.0.1 is not... Um, it, even though it does not allow you to receive requests from the, from over the network, it does allow you to receive requests from other users on the same system. Uh -huh. And they can see which ports are being listened to, uh, yeah. but they would have to know the nonce in order to go to the interface for the weblet. Is this, is this true for Linux? Yes, it's, a, it's extremely true for Linux. Mm. There's no user... ACL that limits your access to a, a, a listen port on 127.0.1. This is why the daemon uses a Unix domain socket. Unix domain sockets are protected by a user ACL. Um, Interesting. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay, my final question. Thank you for answering all these. Um, <laughs> sounds like flame bait. Uh, merge or rebase? Uh, what are we doing in the endo repo uh, the, the context here is when i when i when i told aaron um uh that the uh convention or preference that you communicated to me was to merge with a merge commit uh and a, uh, a conventional commit formatted message uh, he reacted with disbelief <laughs> Yeah, I I believe Chris to be a rebase maximalist. <laughs> um, no, uh, the the a left traversal of the Git Merkle tree of over commits um, must have run in CI and given you a green build. A right traversal of the Git commit Merkle tree does not necessarily hit commits that passed CI with the green. And, and in fact, if you were to put together a pull request where you first commit a failing test and then commit a passing, uh, commit the change that causes the test to pass, that's very, very good and useful behavior, actually. <laughs> like being able to allow your reviewers to check out your branch and then walk through the commits, verify that, hey, this test was previously failing and then succeeding after this um, is super useful. Um, but it's also super useful to eventually when crap hits the fan, which it rarely does, to be able to do a, a, a bisect of the left branch, uh, uh, to do a, a, a git bisect of the left branch of all of your commit history until you find where which merge commit um, introduced a failure. So our preference is to have um, a linear left history with non-overlapping sidings, if you think of it as a railroad, um, non-overlapping sidings on the right. I don't know how the system works underneath the hood. Is that merge or rebase? <laughs> um, it's both. <laughs> the, 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 in order to achieve that aesthetic, uh, before you merge, you first do a rebase, push the rebase of your, of, your, of your pull request branch, force push the pull request of the rebased pull request branch, and then land it with a merge commit. 
that gives you a tidy net in your Git history. Yeah. And, and crucially, and, you, re, you rebase locally, then push that up, then press merge on the merge button, not rebase and merge. And overwrite the merge message. Yeah, that doesn't matter so much. But, and I think that not many Agoric folks actually do. Um, but I personally think that the branch name that you chose for your, for your pull request is not important for the indefinite history of the of the repository what is important is the number of the pull request so that i can go and look on github and figure out how that got into the code base so yeah yeah the, the only way to like actually enforce a format on uh merge commit messages with squashed or otherwise is through <laughs> Uh, GitHub Actions or some sort of draconian uh, out-of-band surveillance system. And uh, the cure is maybe worth, uh, worse than the disease in both of those cases. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. So do what you want, man. I, we're not going <laughs> to... We're not doing either of those things. But my, yeah, my preference is to have a conventional commit message. I, my, my preference is to copy the the a, a conventional commit message from the description of the pull request into the merge and then just leave the merge number uh, in parentheses at the end that's what i do that sounds good oh. um okay great uh full clear thank you very much yeah um, um thanks for landing stuff it's moving oh yeah very 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 excited um yeah until what, next time what's next what are what are you what's the next thing hanging off of the, the fruit tree uh i am currently despecifying id 512 from uh formula pipes and yep. then i'm gonna then i'm gonna see if there's any related work i'm doing to that and then i'm gonna go back to the lookup formula and do uh one lookup formula per path segment as we discussed now that derivation is in Mm hmm cool and yeah we're still decomposing your tcpper and discovering various maintenance tests that should be handled yeah um and the uh and we're at are we at the point where where swiss nums are actually unique yes as of no. last night That's what oh it, no that did land that was the last yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah 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 that no, was the last I, piece I, I swear <laughs> i landed it you're still using zeros though right or never no nope no no zeros, zeros zero, never zero, zero id 512 is nowhere to be found in Fantastic. the demon package that's 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 wonderful. <laughs> yes. All right. <laughs> uh, all right. Cool. Um, you know where to find me. My and the plan of record is to tomorrow um, take this entire ball of wax and turn it into a single railroad siding with a single merge commit at the end and have it on Endomaster. In preparation for doing that, we should merge Endomaster into this branch. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, uh, re re rebase or merge? Well, so the thing is that you, so to date, we've been merging master into Endo periodically to stay to stay afloat. Um, mm -hmm. That that should happen one last time before merging into the um, merging into the master. But then we're going to rebase, which is going to erase all of those merge commits. Ah, mm -hmm. the deities may not let me do this. Yeah, get deities are not going to be happy. We might just have to do a merge commit with it as in its in its gross knotted up state. Mm -hmm. No one will be made happy mm -hmm. by this, but here we are. Yeah, that, the alternative that is to squash with the whole thing. Three co-authors. <laughs> uh, that'd be uh, that would be uh, so so much uh, valor stealing for myself and uh, Aaron. <laughs> uh, 
I might be okay with that, honestly. Um, yeah. The better part of Valor is sharing the Valor. <laughs> uh, all, all for one and one it, for all. So, unfortunately, the contributor <laughs> graph is not uh, weighted by commit size. Right. It, <laughs> Boo. It's, <committed> <laughs> it's the it's the it's the best growth hack for your career, man. <laughs> to, <laughs> get that. <laughs> get, very small, individually reviewable commits. St stacking those uh, intensely green squares uh, on my GitHub profile. Uh, okay. Uh, thanks, gentlemen. Until next time. All right. Thanks.